The Disappearance of Orlando Longmire As of today, very little is known about Orlando Longmire's mysterious disappearance. Orlando Longmire, a 62-year-old individual, was reported missing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on March 30, 2022. Detailed investigation reveals that he was last seen on March 22, after departing from his residence while carrying his required medications. Orlando Longmire, a resident of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, came into this world on June 15, 1959. On the day of March 22, 2022, Orlando departed from his residence while carrying his necessary prescription medication containers. However, from that moment onwards, his family has not had any sight or knowledge of his whereabouts. On the evening of March 30, 2022, Orlando was sighted for the final time at approximately 5 in the vicinity of North 27th Street in Philadelphia. Orlando's whereabouts remain unknown, as there have been no sightings or any communication from him recently. There is a notable familiarity attached to his presence in the vicinity of Fox Street and Hunting Park Avenue. The precise whereabouts of Orlando Longmire and the details surrounding his vanishing continue to be a mystery, leaving the investigation into his case unresolved. The Disappearance of Melissa Lemoyne Melissa Lemoyne, a 39-year-old woman, went missing in Tampa, Florida on July 14, 2023. The circumstances surrounding her disappearance are quite concerning, as she vanished soon after being dropped off at the Frontier Travel Park to meet an individual she had connected with online. During the period when Melissa went missing, she resided in Lutz, Florida, a town situated approximately 15 miles away from Tampa. Lutz, a peaceful community with its distinct charm, provided a serene backdrop. In the scorching afternoon of July 14, 2023, a close relative transported Melissa to the sprawling and bustling Frontier Travel Park, situated conveniently on Nebraska Avenue in the vibrant city of Tampa, Florida. Melissa had made plans to meet an unfamiliar person whom she had been engaging with on Facebook. The purpose of this meeting was to finally meet face to face and get to know each other better. After leaving her last known location, Melissa unfortunately never reached her destination and there has been no communication or information about her whereabouts since. When she did not come back home, her family took the initiative to report her as missing to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, expressing their concern and seeking assistance in locating her whereabouts. The current whereabouts of Melissa Lemoyne, along with the details surrounding her disappearance, continue to be shrouded in mystery. Despite extensive efforts to find her, the case remains unresolved. The Mystery of David Holtz Over 250,000 individuals are reported missing every year, with estimates of actual missing persons cases that are left unreported, pushing that total to more than an expected 300,000 cases annually. With that many reports, it is no wonder that a vast majority of these cases are left unsolved. However, every now and then there are a series of missing cases that emerge that are so peculiar, they become the subject of internet theories and impossible to explain theories. Known as the Missing 411, there appears to be a substantial number of missing persons cases relating to the disappearances of individuals from national parks. In fact, many of these cases are believed to not be investigated too deeply as some form of supernatural or paranormal cover-up takes place in these undisturbed locations. The Sequoia National Park, nestled just south of the renowned Yosemite National Park, boasts breathtaking views of pristine wilderness that, despite its splendor, is often overshadowed by its more popular neighbor. With its magnificent peaks made of predominantly granite, including the towering Mount Whitney, the tallest mountain in the contiguous United States, at a staggering elevation of 14,500 feet, Sequoia National Park holds a mesmerizing allure for adventurers seeking unspoiled natural beauty. Unfortunately for one family, this beauty would be tainted by one of the most tragic events to have occurred in the park during this time. According to the missing persons report, on the 13th of July, back in 1971, a young nine-year-old by the name of David Holtz would suddenly vanish while walking with his family through the Sequoia National Park, leaving behind a haunting mystery for investigators to uncover. Colonel Edward Holtz, a distinguished commanding officer from the Los Angeles Armed Forces Examining and Instruction Center, embarked on a memorable camping and fishing trip with his three sons in this picturesque setting. Choosing the idyllic Dorst Creek campground, 
a location in close proximity to the popular Kings Canyon Visitors Center, and a mere three miles from the awe-inspiring giant General Sherman tree, considered to be the tallest tree in the world, the Holtz family eagerly set out to establish their camp and indulge in their shared passion for fishing. Unfortunately, as the Holtz family returned from their fishing excursion in Dorst Creek, David became separated from his brother Mike after expressing his desire to take a different path. According to Mike, his brother David had been standing behind him a few feet as they talked and walked down the path following their father. Several times as they walked back to their campground together, David pleaded with Mike if they could go together to investigate other pathways and areas away from the main hiking trail. Worried for his brother's safety, Mike would tell David not to step away from the trail and to stay within sight of him as they continued back to the campground. Mike would later tell investigators that as the two brothers were close to the campground, Mike said something to David, but David didn't reply, causing Mike to turn around and realize that David was nowhere nearby. While David's father and brother safely reached the campsite, their hearts sank as they realized David was nowhere to be found. Frantic shouts echoed through the wilderness as they immediately turned back and followed the hiking trail to where they had come from while calling out to nine-year-old David. The anxious group tirelessly scoured the area where David was last seen, but their calls were met with an eerie silence. The newspapers of the time reported Colonel Edward Holtz's heart-wrenching statement that his son was mentally challenged, which further compounded the already challenging search efforts. Determined to leave no stone unturned, the National Park Service, local sheriffs, and dedicated armed forces personnel from Hamilton Air Force Base rallied together to comb through the vast expanses of Sequoia National Park in a valiant attempt to locate David. Days turned into a week as the search persisted, yielding no sign of David. However, a glimmer of hope emerged on the eighth day when a searcher, en route to the Dorst Creek campground, stumbled upon a small tackle box resting on the side of the road. The discovery sent a mix of encouragement and concern through the search party. Colonel Holtz identified the tackle box as belonging to David, intensifying the belief that it was a tangible clue in close proximity to the area he disappeared. The peculiar nature of its placement, along a road traversed daily during the search, seemed almost like a cryptic message, adding an air of mystery to an already perplexing ordeal. Refusing to surrender hope, search parties persisted in scouring the mountainous terrain, their determination unwavering. Curiously, the airborne searches conducted over the area failed to spot David's bright red and orange shirt, the very garment he had been wearing when he vanished. Despite their exhaustive efforts, the formal search for David Holtz was reluctantly concluded after two weeks of relentless pursuit. Nevertheless, Colonel Edward Holtz, driven by unwavering paternal love, could not bear to abandon the quest to find his beloved son. On July 31st, 18 days after David's disappearance, accompanied by a loyal friend, Edward Holtz ventured into an elevated region known as Colony Meadows, situated an estimated 8,000 feet above the point where David had last been seen. Amidst the pristine beauty of this lush, verdant meadow, adorned with majestic giant sequoias, a heartbreaking discovery unfolded. Edward and his companion stumbled upon David Holtz, but they were too late. Regrettably, the available records fail to provide any details regarding the condition of David and what caused him to pass away. And while the Park Service initially attributed his demise to exposure and exhaustion, it is essential to note that no autopsy had been conducted at that time. To unravel the enigma of how David ended up in Colony Meadows from Dorst Creek is a riveting aspect of this tragic tale. If we are to embrace the belief that David's tackle box was indeed discovered along the road leading to Dorst Creek Campground, in a direction completely opposite to where he was eventually found, it implies that David, who was only nine at the time, ventured further east, tracing the path upstream of the creek, ultimately leading him towards the captivating meadow directly through the path of active search and rescue volunteers. It appears that David, rather than retracing his steps along the road back to the campground, or even venturing towards the nearby major highway, embarked on a path that led him below Colony Meadows. There, he encountered a treacherously steep and rock-faced mountainside, an imposing obstacle that seemingly rose vertically for 700 to 900 feet, depending on the precise route he took, a height and steepness that would have been impossible for even experienced climbers to have pursued, and completely unfathomable for such a young individual. 
Adding another layer of intrigue to this haunting tale, it is disheartening to note that the case file, which could potentially shed further light on the search for David, has been inexplicably destroyed. After the Sequoia National Park was petitioned with a Freedom of Information Act to force the release of any information the park had gathered on the David Holtz case, the National Park officials would respond to the query with the claim that all information surrounding Holtz had been recently destroyed. While the fate of David remains shrouded in uncertainty, his story resonates deeply with the countless other missing persons cases that have plagued communities worldwide. The Mystery of Charles C. Morgan In the early morning hours of March 22, 1977, Charles Morgan, an escrow agent residing in Phoenix, Arizona, mysteriously disappeared after leaving his home. However, after an agonizing three days, he finally returned to his wife, Ruth, with an unsettling revelation. It was around two in the morning when he made his way back, with noticeable restraints adorning his body, a plastic handcuff encircling one ankle and handcuffs tightly securing his hands. Unable to vocalize his distress, Charles pointed urgently to his throat, silently indicating his inability to speak. Recognizing his communication limitations, Ruth promptly offered him a pen and paper, to which he scribbled a haunting message. He had been subjected to the ingestion of a potent hallucinogenic medication that could potentially ravage his delicate nervous system. Fearful for her husband's well-being, Ruth expressed her desire to involve the authorities or seek medical attention. However, Charles, aware of the risks involved, implored her not to take any action that could jeopardize the safety of their family. During the time that Ruth cared for him and aided his recovery, he revealed a shocking revelation. He had been employed as a covert operative, working undercover for the U.S. Treasury Department for a period spanning two to three years. However, he did not elaborate further, mentioning only that his captors had forcibly taken away his Treasury identification. Disturbingly, Two months subsequent to his initial disappearance, he once again vanished without a trace. It was after a hiatus of nine days that Ruth found herself at the receiving end of an enigmatic phone call from a mysterious woman who conveyed the cryptic message, Chuck is all right, and abruptly terminated the call. The inexplicable reference to Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8, added another layer of intrigue to an already perplexing situation. Two days elapsed following the enigmatic phone call precisely on June 18th, when Charles was finally discovered lifeless. The resting place lay 40 miles to the west of Tucson, adjacent to his abandoned vehicle. The discovery revealed that Charles had met a tragic fate, having suffered a pistol wound to the back of his head, inflicted by none other than his own firearm. What further perplexed investigators was the fact that he was found wearing a bulletproof vest, adorned with a belt buckle, cunningly concealing a hidden knife and a holster that once housed his weapon. The intriguing twist in this already enigmatic tale unfolded with the presence of a pair of sunglasses at the scene, conspicuously not belonging to the deceased. As the investigation delved deeper, Charles's car became the focal point of scrutiny. By meticulously combing through its contents, authorities unearthed an assortment of weaponry and a substantial stockpile of ammunition, leaving little doubt as to his preparedness for unforeseen circumstances. However, the perplexities did not end there. The car itself had undergone modifications, ingeniously allowing it to be unlocked from the fender. This detail not only added to the mystique surrounding Charles's demise, but also hinted at a deliberate attempt to obfuscate his intentions or perhaps protect valuable possessions. Adding to the bizarre chain of events, a startling discovery was made on the rear seat of the vehicle, a tooth belonging to Morgan, neatly wrapped in a white handkerchief. The inexplicable nature of this find left investigators puzzled, as it presented more questions than answers. In a twist that seemed to border on the surreal, a peculiar item was also discovered, an elusive $2 bill. On its surface, several Spanish surnames were scrawled, capturing the attention of those engaged in the investigation. Attached to the bill was a meticulously pinned map of the border area, encompassing the regions between Tucson and Mexico, specifically leading to Robles Junction and Felicity. Notoriously known for their illicit activities during that era, these towns held a reputation for smuggling. Adding to the enigma were the words Ecclesiastes 12 etched above the surnames, accompanied by an arrow that pointed towards specific digits in the bill's serial number, K-12. 
cunningly highlighting the numbers 1 and 8. According to the medical examiners, Charles Morgan was reportedly deceased for a duration of approximately 12 hours prior to being discovered. It is particularly peculiar that no fingerprints were detected at the crime scene, not even on the firearm. However, gunpowder residue and traces were found on Morgan's hands. Due to these findings, the sheriff's department concluded that the cause of his passing was self-inflicted, thus closing the investigation into the Charles C. Morgan case. The absence of fingerprints on the scene, especially on the pistol, raises further questions about the circumstances surrounding Morgan's demise. The presence of gunpowder and residue on his hands provides a significant clue. Ruth Morgan adamantly refuted the theory and firmly maintains the belief that her late husband was not a victim of natural causes, but rather met with foul play. The Mysterious Disappearance of Bradley Straitner Bradley Straitner, a 30-year-old individual, went missing on October 30, 2019, in Leesville, Louisiana. This incident occurred when he left his residence with the purpose of returning a vehicle to his girlfriend. Bradley Straitner, a distinguished individual, came into this world on the 29th of July, 1989. Being a proud member of the Four Winds tribe, he holds a significant position within the esteemed Louisiana Cherokee Confederacy. He has a deep fondness for nature and possesses exceptional skills in navigating the wilderness. His family and friends find it highly unusual that he has gone missing without maintaining any form of communication with them. On the 30th of October, in the year 2019, Bradley Strakener found himself in the charming and welcoming town of Sandy Hill. At approximately 1.45 in the afternoon, he departed from the apartment he cohabited with his roommate, embarking on a journey to return his girlfriend's car, which happened to be located around 10 miles away. Bradley, unfortunately, never arrived at his intended location and has remained completely unreachable ever since. On the morning of October 31st, 2019, Precisely at 6.30 in the morning, the vehicle in which Bradley was last sighted was discovered deserted in close proximity to a hunting property that had been leased. This property is situated on Bundix Road, near Highway 10, at a distance of approximately two miles from the location where Bradley was last observed. Upon discovery, the vehicle was located in an unlocked state, and to further exacerbate the situation, the keys were left carelessly on the passenger seat. Despite this alarming discovery, Authorities were perplexed to find an absence of any indications or traces of a struggle. Numerous diligent searches were extensively carried out across the designated vicinity, yet regrettably, no discernible traces or indications pertaining to his current location were unearthed. In a significant development, Bradley's mother Tony has assumed the prestigious role of Louisiana director within Community United Effort, which is also known as the esteemed Center for Missing Persons. In the month of May in the year 2022, the organization undertook an extensive search operation in the Sandy Hills region with the aim of locating Bradley. To aid in this search, highly trained cadaver dogs were employed, their expert noses meticulously scouring the area in hopes of finding any clues. The disappearance of Bradley is currently under investigation by authorities who believe that foul play may be involved. Despite their suspicions, no specific individuals or persons of interest have been identified as potential suspects. Despite ongoing efforts, his case remains unresolved. The Disappearance of Lester Whitmire Lester Whitmire, a 65-year-old individual, was last observed on June 18, 2021, in the vicinity of Oak Ridge, Oregon. An intriguing detail about his disappearance is that he mentioned his intention to visit the McCready Hot Springs, which subsequently led to his vanishing. Lester Whitmire's last known sighting occurred on June 18, 2021, as confirmed by a family member. During that period, he resided in the Oak Ridge region of Oregon. According to his statement, Whitmire declared his intention to visit the McCready Hot Springs. On July 2, 2021, his disappearance was formally documented to the Lane County Sheriff's Office an official report was filed expressing concern over his whereabouts. Lester's automobile, along with his possessions securely stored within, was discovered in the vast expanse of the Willamette National Forest, positioned to the east of the town of Oak Ridge. The search and rescue team of Lane County Sheriff meticulously combed through the vicinity in which his vehicle was discovered, 
painstakingly searching for any traces or hints that could lead them to his exact location. Despite their extensive efforts, no supplementary clues or information regarding his whereabouts were uncovered. Lester is known to have connections with the Redmond area, but there is limited information regarding his case. The whereabouts of Lester Whitmire, along with the details surrounding his vanishing, continue to be a mystery that has yet to be unravelled. His case is categorised as a missing persons investigation and has remained unsolved, leaving many unanswered questions. The Mysterious Disappearance of Erica Frasier Erica Frasier, a 17-year-old girl, went missing in Brooksville, Kentucky on October 21, 1997. This unfortunate event took place when she was heading home after enjoying a night out with her friends. Erica Frasier, a Kentucky native, came into this world on May 6, 1980, to her loving parents, Maggie Doherty and Kevin Frasier. In 1997, Erica found herself in her final year of high school at Bracken County High School. With her sights set on a future in accounting, she had already made plans to attend Northern Kentucky University upon graduating. Balancing her studies and ambitions, Erica also dedicated her time to working part-time at Carota's Pizza, a popular local pizza joint nestled in the heart of Augusta. In the evening of October 21, 1997, Erica was spotted socializing with her companions near the Video N Tan establishment in Brooksville, Kentucky. This interaction occurred between the hours of 9 and 10 in the evening. Erica Frasier, a young woman who set out from her home, tragically never made it back. Erica's absence was brought to the attention of the Bracken County Sheriff's Office by her concerned mother as she failed to make it back home. On the 22nd of October in the year 1997, Erica's car, which was a 1988 Pontiac Bonneville, was discovered unlocked and deserted in a field situated off Frunks Lane, right on the outskirts of Brooksville. During the investigation, law enforcement discovered that Erica's possessions, including her purse, wallet, checkbook and money, were located inside her vehicle. However, the keys to the car were later found in a field across the road. Interestingly, upon examining the car, the police did not find any fingerprints, foreign hairs or indications of any suspicious activity or wrongdoing. There is currently no evidence to suggest that Erica voluntarily departed on her own accord, and it should be noted that she did not collect the $100 paycheck that was awaiting her at Carota's Pizza. She chose not to share her intentions of embarking on a journey with her circle of friends, and there were no previous instances of her spontaneously leaving without notice. It is worth noting that she consistently demonstrated commendable academic performance, and there were no discernible signs of distress or turmoil in her personal life. On October 21, 1997, Erica Lee Freyshaw vanished under mysterious circumstances. She was last spotted in her vehicle, accompanied by Shane M. Simcox, a 20-year-old individual whom she had only known for less than 12 months. This puzzling disappearance raises numerous questions about the nature of their relationship. In a remarkably detailed account provided to the police, Simcox explained that he had been engaging in an evening of socializing with his companions, enjoying a series of visits to various bars. As the night progressed, and a moderate amount of alcohol had been consumed, Simcox found himself situated on a street corner in Brooksville, Kentucky. Based on Simcox's account, Erica extended an invitation to him to accompany her on a sightseeing trip around the city. This invitation was extended after one of Erica's friends left the vehicle, providing an opportunity for them to spend some quality time together. Their private ride lasted somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes, allowing them to engage in meaningful conversation and enjoy each other's company. The Disappearance of Margaret Mary Kohler On the 20th of February, back in 2011, a 53-year-old woman by the name of Margaret Kohler would suddenly vanish after planning a short daytime visit to the Cummins Creek Wilderness. Although investigators originally thought that Margaret's case was that of an inexperienced hiker traveling too deep within the National Park Forest, investigators would soon realize that Margaret Kohler would frequently travel to the Cummins Creek Wilderness to forage for wild mushrooms and truffles. According to Margaret's friend, Mrs. Kohler had become quite familiar with the region and would often take weekly trips to the area with her five-year-old Labrador Border Collie mix, named Roscoe. Growing up in the seaside city of Waldport, Oregon, Margaret Kohler had become highly experienced with the outdoors, Cummins Creek Wilderness, and the surrounding trails, 
and was known by her friends and family as having been an avid hiker. Yet, regardless of her vast amount of wilderness experience and her many safety precautions, Margaret Kohler would seemingly vanish with no trace of her left behind. The search for Margaret would begin on the day of her disappearance after her friend contacted the local sheriff's department and claimed that she was unable to make contact with Mrs. Kohler at their scheduled time. Due to her frequently traveling alone, Margaret was worried that if she did not take the necessary precautions, she could end up injured and stranded out in the national park without anyone knowing she was gone. It was for this very reason that Margaret told her friend prior to her trip that she was planning on taking Roscoe for a walk near the Cape Perpetua area. Although the last time Margaret had been seen was on the 19th of February, after getting an expected time frame of Margaret's itinerary from her friend, detectives were able to put an accurate time to when Margaret Kohler had arrived in the area, believed to have been during the early morning. Within only eight hours of her disappearance, the Lane and Lincoln County Sheriff's Department, alongside the United States Forest Service and the Oregon State Police, would begin their search and rescue efforts for Margaret and Roscoe. Oddly enough, after scouring several parking lots and common stops, the search and rescue teams were unable to locate Margaret Kohler's vehicle. Given the fact that the investigators were unsure which trail Margaret Kohler had followed, it made it increasingly difficult for search and rescue teams to efficiently check a tighter radius, forcing them to expand their search to a much larger area. Local volunteer groups had spent the better part of the first two days walking up and down the Cape Perpetua area, but were unable to find any tracks or signs of Margaret Kohler having visited anywhere in the region. With the lack of any sign of Margaret's vehicle or equipment anywhere near the region, investigators started to wonder whether or not the missing hiker was even within the park. For this reason, in conjunction with the search and rescue efforts, the local sheriff's department would keep out a missing person's file for any information relating to Margaret's disappearance, worried that she could have been the victim of foul play or could have gotten into a car accident in an isolated area. It would be due to these suspicions that the search and rescue efforts were temporarily reduced over the course of about two weeks. It would not be until the 3rd of March that proof of Margaret having arrived in the park was found. According to the United States Forest Service, one of the Forest Service law enforcement officers had found Margaret's van on the side of Forest Service Road in the Cummins Ridge Trail area. The Cummins Ridge Road was a far deeper major pathway that was only accessible after driving south through an area known as Neptune State Scenic Viewpoint, past a coastal area named the Devil's Churn due to its history of supernatural sightings. Inexperienced hikers would not have been able to see that the small trail opens up into a much larger pathway and so investigators were certain that Margaret must have visited the area several times in the past to know exactly how much room there would be for her vehicle. The vehicle itself was completely unoccupied, and after having been searched, a park receipt would be located that would confirm that Margaret Kohler had reached the park sometime on the 20th of February. Immediately after the vehicle was discovered by the United States Forest Service law enforcement officer, a massive search would be conducted in the area for a 10-mile radius. Unfortunately, despite more than 50 volunteers involved in the search, no sign of Margaret or her dog Roscoe was uncovered. On the following day, a team of bloodhounds were brought to the abandoned vehicle to help find a trackable scent, however, due to the tremendous gap in time from Margaret's initial disappearance and the discovery of her vehicle, the experienced canine teams were unable to locate a scent they could track. Oddly enough, on the 5th of March, more than two weeks since Margaret had disappeared, Roughly 2.2 miles south of where Margaret's abandoned vehicle was located, local search and rescue volunteers would find Roscoe casually walking along the area of Ten Mile Creek. Once investigators took a closer look at Roscoe, they were surprised to find that the dog appeared to have been in perfect health. Deputies with the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office would make several attempts to get Roscoe to lead them to where Margaret may have been, but the dog seemed too playful and easily distracted making it impossible for search and rescuers to get the dog to lead them back to Margaret. To this day, no sign of Margaret Kohler has even been uncovered. Oddly enough, across many of the bizarre missing 411 disappearances, it is commonly reported that during a sudden vanishing, hikers who travelled with a dog will often have their canines show up several days after their disappearance, but with no sign of the hiker ever being uncovered. Even more peculiar, the returning canines will often seem to be in perfect condition, 
regardless of the weather conditions or the number of days missing, as if no time had passed for them in the interim. Pope John Paul II personally performed three exorcisms during his reign. While the Vatican typically refuses to call an event an actual exorcism, they do, however, acknowledge the events which they are describing. The Pope might seem symbolic as we usually only see ceremonious duties, but the Catholic head does perform papal exorcisms and other duties. Italian journalist Fabio Marquis Ragona has always maintained that he believes that demons are real and prowl about the earth looking for souls. He is a primary source for the history of Vatican exorcisms, John Paul II being no exception. Ragona stated that he has spoken to several exorcists who said the devil was terrified of John Paul II. He is said to have performed at least three exorcisms in his day, in 1982, 1984 and 2000. Before John Paul II, exorcism was considered a medieval practice, going away with the development of medicine and technology, but in 1998 the Pope actually approved an updated form of the rite of exorcism, nearly 400 years after the first rite was established and released. He himself had already performed two exorcisms at this point, and believed it was necessary to have this practice reinstated and, when necessary, used. On March 27, 1982, Francesca was with her family when they arrived in St. Peter's Square. Doctors were unable to solve the enigma, as the woman was under the care of a priest who was an exorcist, and of her parish priest at the time. Because her case was so unexplainable and unsolvable, Bishop Alberti of Spoleto brought the young woman before the Pope. This woman was completely emotionless. The Pope brought forth the rite of exorcism and began to read it in Latin. As the scripture was read aloud, she began to tremble and ultimately rolled around on the floor, shouting and shrieking. He was praying and eventually the possession was pulled from her body and left her alone, finally. The woman, Francesca, is leading a normal life, married with four children. Gabrielli Amorth was the exorcist for the Diocese of Rome. Francesca visited him afterwards and with his own eyes saw that the woman was completely fine and normal. Demonic possession is a phenomenon deeply ingrained in the annals of human history, transcending cultures, religions, and time periods. The belief in supernatural entities inhabiting human bodies, often leading to erratic behavior and affliction, has shaped societies and religious doctrines for millennia. The concept of demonic possession can be traced back to ancient civilizations, where it played a central role in understanding the inexplicable. In Mesopotamia, the Epic of Gilgamesh mentions spirits and malevolent forces that could possess humans. In ancient Egypt, various spells and rituals were developed to exorcise evil spirits believed to cause illnesses. In the Hebrew Bible, particularly the Old Testament, accounts of demonic possession are found. The Hebrew word Shadim refers to evil spirits or demons that were believed to influence human behavior. Notable instances include King Saul's possession in the Book of Samuel, and the story of the demon-possessed man in the New Testament's Gospel of Mark. Demonic possession also held significance in classical antiquity. Ancient Greeks believed in daemons, supernatural beings that could possess individuals, leading to madness or erratic behavior. Greek mythology featured tales of people being possessed by various gods and spirits, such as Dionysus, the god of wine and ecstasy. In Roman society, Belief in spirits and possession persisted, with exorcisms and rituals aimed at banishing malevolent entities. The Roman historian Livy documented instances of demonic possession in his works, emphasizing the role of supernatural forces in human affairs. Demonic possession took on a new dimension with the rise of Christianity in the medieval period. The church played a pivotal role in shaping beliefs about possession, with the emergence of exorcism as a formalized ritual. The Gospels' accounts of Jesus' exorcisms contributed to the Church's recognition of the phenomenon. The infamous Salem witch trials in the late 17th century are a dark chapter in the history of demonic possession. In Puritan America, fear of witches and possession led to the persecution and execution of numerous individuals accused of being possessed or practicing witchcraft. During the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods, 
there was a shift towards more rational and scientific explanations for behaviors previously attributed to demonic possession. The emergence of psychology and the understanding of illnesses marked a turning point in how society viewed cases of possession. Prominent figures like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung began to interpret alleged possession as manifestations of psychological disorders, often influenced by suppressed traumas or personal conflicts. As a result, exorcisms and witch hunts gradually declined in favor of medical and psychiatric interventions. In contemporary times, the belief in demonic possession persists in certain religious and cultural contexts. While skepticism about possession as a supernatural phenomenon prevails in secular societies, it remains a potent force in many religious communities. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, continues to perform exorcisms under specific circumstances. Cultural expressions of demonic possession have also evolved. Horror films, literature, and popular culture often draw on the concept of possession to terrify and captivate audiences. A group of approximately 250 clergymen hailing from 50 different nations has gathered in the Eternal City of Rome. Their purpose, to deepen their understanding of the intricate and often mysterious phenomenon of demonic possession. This exceptional congregation of priests has come together to engage in an enlightening exploration, one that encompasses not only theoretical knowledge, but also first-hand experiences shared by their fellow brethren. Exorcism continues to be a topic of considerable controversy, primarily fueled by its portrayal in popular culture and horror movies. However, it is important to acknowledge that alongside this media representation, there have also been instances where the practice of exorcism has been associated with cases of misuse. The week-long educational program organized by the Vatican, known as the Exorcism and the Prayer of Liberation, is widely recognized as the sole international series of lectures dedicated to this particular subject matter. Commencing its inaugural session in the year 2005, this program has witnessed a remarkable increase in participant numbers, with the attendance of priests more than doubling since its inception. Catholic priests from various countries have recently shared with the media that there has been a noticeable rise in individuals coming forward and recounting experiences that they believe to be indicative of being possessed by demonic entities. In a significant pronouncement made last year, Pope Francis emphasized the importance of addressing the genuine spiritual disturbances that some parishioners may face. According to reports, the number of individuals seeking exorcisms in Italy reaches an astonishing half a million annually. This phenomenon is not exclusive to Italy alone, as a 2017 report by Christian think tank Theos indicated a growing trend in the United Kingdom as well. One contributing factor to this increase is believed to be the proliferation of Pentecostal churches. In response to the increasing demand, several dioceses have taken the initiative to create their own educational programs. This trend can be observed in regions such as Sicily in Italy and the bustling city of Chicago in the United States. According to Father Gary Thomas, an experienced American priest with over a decade of exorcism practice, there has been a notable rise in the demand for exorcisms. One contributing factor to this phenomenon, he suggests, is the growing reliance on social sciences in our society, resulting in fewer churches training priests as exorcists. This decline in exorcism training within the Christian church has subsequently led to an increase in superstitious beliefs and practices. As society increasingly leans towards a more scientific and secular approach, the traditional role of exorcists has diminished. According to Italian priest Benigno Paglia, who shared his insights with Vatican News, the increasing popularity of practices like tarot card readings and sorcery has sparked a resurgence in the need for exorcisms. In the realm of exorcisms, it is important to note that only a small fraction of cases truly necessitate a significant exorcism procedure. In the year 1999, the Catholic Church embarked on a significant endeavor to revise and update the regulations governing exorcism, marking the first comprehensive revision since the year 1614. In the process of dealing with a possessed individual, the priest will employ a sequence of deliverance prayers to alleviate the presence of evil. According to information provided by Catholic officials, during a possession ritual, it is customary for the priest to wear a specific attire consisting of an intricately embroidered white tunic known as a surplice, accompanied by a stole in the color purple. In order to ensure the effectiveness of the ritual, 
the individual believed to be possessed is often physically restrained. Furthermore, the utilization of holy water is considered an essential element in this process. In a comprehensive and in-depth manner, the priest invokes the intercession of saints, engages in prayer, and shares selected passages from the Bible that depict Jesus' powerful acts of exorcising demons from afflicted individuals. Through the invocation of Jesus' name, the priest beseeches the malevolent spirit that has possessed an individual to submit to the divine authority of God and to depart from the afflicted person's being. This entreaty, replete with unwavering determination, may be repeated as many times as necessary until the exorcism is deemed successful by the discerning priest. Once convinced of the spirit's departure, the priest then engages in prayer, fervently seeking divine intervention to ensure that the tormenting presence of the evil entity will no longer afflict the individual. Christianity has been the origin of countless theological debates. Even today, the many enigmas of the faith continue to haunt the natural curiosity of humanity. For all its faults or virtues, it's impossible to deny Christianity's plentiful and intriguing history. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three Christian discoveries. Crypt believed to be Jesus' tomb opened for the first time in centuries. The story of Jesus' return from death is perhaps one of the most popular biblical stories, but the tomb that may have belonged to him has sat dark, dim and unopened for centuries until now. Researchers investigating Old Jerusalem uncovered a tomb. Inside the tomb sat a limestone bed, just like the one rumoured to have been used for the body of Christ in those three days before he rose again. With the researchers was the Greek Orthodox father, Isidorus Fakitsis, who stated, We saw where Jesus Christ was laid down. Before, nobody has. We have the history, the tradition. Now we saw with our own eyes the actual burial place of Jesus Christ. Researchers spent 60 hours investigating the tomb. Before they left it, they reinforced its supports to preserve it for the future. Yet with little to no intention of returning for the foreseeable years. Before it was resealed, an estimated 50 scientists, researchers and priests visited the site and very well might be the only people to see it with their own eyes for decades, if not centuries to come. A shrine has long since been built around the tomb, a holy site known as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Throughout its existence, many Christians have come to this church to lay their respects. The tomb was first discovered long before our time when the first Christian Roman Emperor, Constantine, ruled in the 4th century AD. In the 7th century, the region was ravaged by Persian forces following the fall of Jerusalem and later again in the 11th century was destroyed during the conflict with the Muslim Caliphs. It had a long, extensive history of being destroyed and rebuilt, though the tomb remained sealed all this time or as far as we know. Various organizations were chosen to deal with the research of the tomb and its investigation, including the National Geographic Society, the National Technical University of Athens, and the National Geographic Channel. The project as a whole circles around the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The researchers had no initial intention of heading into the tomb. The shrine had fallen into disrepair. The mortar, columns, and every aspect of the shrine needed to be disassembled and replaced or restored. The researchers worried that there could be a leak within the tomb that led them to unseal it. When the tomb was opened, it was done in a highly specific, careful manner, as archaeologists predicted lifting the entrance would fracture it. According to the assistant professor of civil engineering, Harris Mazakis, we had to be very careful. It was not just a tomb we had to open. It was the tomb of Jesus Christ that is a symbol for all of Christianity, and not only for them, but for other religions. Muzakis claims that the restoration has gone successfully and will preserve the shrine for another 500 years or so. The Nazareth Inscription The Nazareth Inscription is one of the most recognized Christian relics. It's a Greek marble tablet upon which sits the Nazareth Decree, written supposedly 
by an unnamed individual of the Caesar line. The decree asserts that tomb robbing or destruction is punishable by the highest means, and was initially dated to the 1st century AD. The Louvre currently possesses the 24 by 15 inch Nazareth inscription. Despite never mentioning Jesus Christ, it has come to be known as a staple Christian relic. Despite its name pertaining to Nazareth, researchers found that it likely originated in Kos, a Greek island. This has shaken the Christian community and put doubt into whether any connection exists between the tablet and Christianity at all. Historians have since suggested that the inscription may have been about the tomb of Nicias, a Greek tyrant, and dated to 20 BCE instead of early AD. Investigations have proven it could have been created any time between 50 BCE and 50 AD. Of its known history, in 1878, the tablet was purchased by Wilhelm Fruner in Nazareth itself. Fruner sent the tablet to Paris. This means that although the tablet was in Nazareth, it likely had not been found there, but rather was sold there, as at the time Jerusalem had a booming relic and antiquities marketplace. The text also refers not to the one Christian God, but to plural gods, and further lessening its likelihood to truly have anything to do with the faith. Another reason why it's unlikely that the Nazareth tablet is from Nazareth is the lack of marble in Jerusalem. If it was made there, the marble would have been imported. However, the Greek dialect archaeologists have found is not fluent, therefore its origins to this day remain a mystery. Evidence Noah's Biblical Flood Happened Christians, historians, and archaeologists have all yearned to uncover whether there is any truth behind the biblical tale of Noah's Ark for millennia. Now an archaeologist believes he has uncovered the truth behind the mythical happening, claiming its presence in the Bible was based on a real-life flood. Underwater archaeologist Robert Ballard has stated he and his researchers uncovered the evidence of Noah's Ark near the coast of Turkey in the Black Sea. Originally, the team was searching for lost ancient civilizations beneath sea level. Robert Ballard was one of those responsible for the impeccable discovery of the Titanic. According to Ballard, 12,000 years ago, that part of the world was covered in ice. When that ice began to melt, the sea levels rose significantly, flooding major parts of the world. Students of the University of Columbia suggested that there was only one flood in the Black Sea region that thousands of years ago, the Black Sea was nothing more than a lone freshwater lake in the midst of hills and meadows, until a terrible flood from the Mediterranean Sea covered those meadows and all that land, expanding the sea level and creating the Black Sea as it is now known. Ballard was taken by the theory and set out to investigate. The team found an ancient shoreline, 400 feet below the sea level, Evidence to prove that the Black Sea suffered, at some point in its history, a massive flood. The fossils located near this flooded shoreline revealed it occurred about 7,000 years ago, slotting perfectly with the time frame Christian scholars believe Noah's Ark happened. Ballard's theory is that word of mouth of the terrible flood, which would have been abrupt and unexpected, passed generationally until finally being recorded and added to the Bible. Because many aspects of the biblical tale seem impossible, such as Noah's extraordinary life expectancy of several hundred years, it's considered more probable that the Black Sea Flood inspired the story rather than as a direct account of what happened, though it remains a mystery still. Some scholars pose that Noah's Ark might have been further inspired by the ancient epic of Gilgamesh. Eric Klein, a biblical archaeologist, claims the earlier Mesopotamian stories are very similar where the gods are sending a flood to wipe out humans. There is one man they choose to survive. He builds a boat and brings on animals and lands on a mountain and lives happily ever after. I would argue that it is the same story. It's uncertain whether Noah's Ark, as the Bible records it, actually happened. But Ballard's discovery proves that there were devastating floods in that same period of time and that people did struggle to keep their communities afloat and alive. Ballard's research found many fragments of antique pottery and a sunken ship. 
There, the team uncovered a molar and femur bone. The entire wreck was extremely well preserved as a result of the little oxygen in the Black Sea where life struggles to exist. As such, decay rapidly slows in its depths. Unfortunately, the ship was only dated to about 500 BCE, nowhere near the 7,000-year mark that would signify the right flood. Ballard, however, is determined to keep investigating the region to uncover more evidence and to get to the bottom of the truth. He asserts the deep sea is the largest museum on Earth. Ballard does not believe that Noah's Ark, as we know it, will ever be discovered. If it ever existed, it likely decayed by now. But what can be found is proof that communities lived down in those depths before the sea levels rose. In April 2019, the Indian Army claimed to have discovered footprints of the elusive Yeti, also known as the Abominable Snowman, near the Makalu base camp in the Himalayas. The discovery sparked widespread interest and debate among scientists and enthusiasts alike, as the existence of the Yeti has long been a subject of speculation and legend. The footprints found by the Indian Army were reported to be 32 by 15 inches in size and were said to be human-like in appearance, but with distinctly larger footprints. The prints were found at an altitude of over 19,000 feet, making it unlikely that they could have been made by a human or any other known animal. The Yeti, a legendary creature said to inhabit the Himalayan region, has been the subject of numerous reports and sightings over the years. However, despite extensive efforts to track and study the creature, no definitive evidence of its existence has ever been found. The discovery of the footprints by the Indian Army has raised new questions about the existence of the Yeti and has sparked renewed interest in the search for the creature. However, some scientists remain skeptical, noting that the footprints could have been made by other animals or natural phenomena. There have been numerous claims of sightings and encounters with the Yeti over the years, but few have been substantiated by concrete evidence. In some cases, Supposed sightings have been attributed to other known animals, such as bears or large primates. In other cases, sightings have been dismissed as hoaxes or misinterpretations of natural phenomena. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, the search for the Yeti continues to captivate the public's imagination. Many people believe that the creature may hold the key to unlocking new secrets about the Himalayan region, and that its discovery could have significant implications for the fields of biology and anthropology. Whether or not the Indian Army's discovery of footprints near the Makalu base camp represents proof of the Yeti's existence remains to be seen. However, the discovery has sparked renewed interest in the search for the elusive creature and has reignited the debate over the existence of the Yeti. Many people were not happy with how the Indian Army was treated when they came forward with the claims, saying that they were ridiculed, even though they provided evidence in the form of photographs. Those who investigate the unknown have said that this is one of the main reasons why groups, people and governments don't come forward with their sightings and evidence, because when they do, they usually get mocked. As our understanding of the natural world continues to grow, it is possible that we may one day be able to definitively answer the question of whether the Yeti exists. However, until that time, the legend of the abominable snowman remains a fascinating and enduring mystery one that continues to capture the imagination of people around the world. For hundreds of years, the Yeti is said to have been sighted throughout the Himalayan region of Asia. Reports and sightings of the creature date back centuries, and the origins of the Yeti legend are shrouded in mystery. One of the earliest reports of the Yeti comes from a French missionary named Father Francois Valentin. In the early 18th century, Valentin travelled to the region now known as Bhutan, where he heard stories from locals about a mysterious creature that lived in the mountains. According to the locals, the creature was said to be large and covered in long fur. It was said to be capable of walking upright like a human and was known to leave large footprints in the snow. The locals referred to the creature as the Meto Kangmi, which translates to man-bear snowman. Valentin was intrigued by the stories he heard and decided to investigate further. He set out into the mountains with a group of local guides, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature for himself. However, after several days of searching, he was unable to find any definitive evidence of the Yeti's existence. Despite his lack of success, 
Valentin's report helped to spread the legend of the Yeti beyond the confines of the Himalayan region. In the years that followed, more and more reports and sightings of the creature began to emerge, further fueling interest in the search for the elusive creature. Over time, the legend of the Yeti has become one of the most enduring mysteries of the natural world. While there have been many reports and sightings of the creature over the years, none have been definitively proven and many scientists remain skeptical of its existence. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, interest in the search for the Yeti continues to captivate people around the world. Many people believe that the creature may hold the key to unlocking new secrets about the Himalayan region and that its discovery could have significant implications for the fields of biology and anthropology. There are those who believe that the Yeti could be more than just a legend and that it could actually be a lost human civilization or descendant. The idea that the Yeti could be a lost human civilization is based on the fact that many of the reported sightings of the creature describe it as being human-like in appearance. Some witnesses have reported seeing the creature walking upright like a human, while others have described it as having features that resemble those of humans. Proponents of the lost civilization theory suggest that the Yeti could be a remnant of a group of humans that migrated to the Himalayan region thousands of years ago. According to this theory, the humans could have developed unique physical traits over time, such as the ability to survive in high-altitude environments, and could have evolved into a distinct population that was separate from the rest of humanity. There are also those who believe that the Yeti could be a descendant of the Denisovans, a group of ancient humans that lived in the region that is now Siberia. The Denisovans are believed to have interbred with modern humans and Neanderthals, and their DNA has been found in populations across Asia. Some scientists believe that the Yeti could be a descendant of the Denisovans, and that its unique physical characteristics could be the result of thousands of years of adaptation to the harsh Himalayan environment. While the lost civilization theory and the Denisovan theory are intriguing, there is little concrete evidence to support either idea. Most scientists remain skeptical of the existence of the Yeti and believe that the reported sightings of the creature can be attributed to natural phenomena, misinterpretations of known animals, or hoaxes. However, there are some who believe that the existence of the Yeti cannot be ruled out completely and that more research is needed to explore the possibility that the creature could be a lost human civilization or descendant. One of the challenges in investigating the lost civilization theory or the Denisovan theory, is the difficulty in obtaining concrete evidence. The harsh Himalayan environment makes it difficult to conduct extensive archaeological or genetic research, and sightings of the creature are often brief and inconclusive. Despite these challenges, there are some researchers who are working to gather more evidence on the possible existence of the Yeti. For example, some researchers are using advanced DNA analysis techniques to study hair samples that are believed to have come from the creature. While the results of these studies have so far been inconclusive, they represent an important step forward in the search for the truth about the Yeti. Although this is an interesting theory, as of right now, there is little concrete evidence to support the idea that the Yeti could be a lost human civilization or descendant, but the possibility remains intriguing. The reported sightings of the creature suggest that there is something out there in the Himalayan region that we have yet to fully understand. As our understanding of the natural world continues to grow, it is possible that we may one day be able to definitively answer the question of whether the Yeti exists. However, until that time, the legend of the abominable snowman remains a fascinating and enduring mystery, one that continues to capture the imagination of people around the world. As of right now, the earliest report of the Yeti comes from Father Francois Valentin in the early 18th century. While his investigation did not yield any definitive proof of the creature's existence, his report helped to spread the legend of the Yeti beyond the confines of the Himalayan region. Today, the search for the elusive creature continues to captivate people around the world, and the legend of the abominable snowman remains a fascinating and enduring mystery. Russian Defense Minister announces plan to resurrect a 3,000-year-old Scythian army through cloning. Science fiction has been a popular genre of novels and movies for decades, but as they say, reality is stranger than fiction. 
you would expect that cloning a three millennia old Scythian army would be something taken straight from the pages of a science fiction comic or an unusual episode of Black Mirror. But a Russian defense minister argues it is possible. Around 20 years ago, an archaeological marvel was uncovered in Siberia, Russia. Researchers and archaeologists found, buried deep within the earth and graven of the Tuva Republic, the skeletal remains of over 3,000-year-old warriors of Scythian descent with the bones of their mighty steeds. One could argue that these warriors had already done their part for humanity and deserved to peacefully lay in the afterlife, but Sergei Shoigu, a Russian defense minister, begs to differ. Sergei Shoigu has publicly announced his desire to take the remains of these surely great warriors from centuries past and clone them into a brand new military unit. Shoigu is a native of the Republic of Tuva and believes strongly in the possibility of raising a modern Scythian army to fight and defend Russia and all her territories. He revealed these unique intentions in an online meeting with the Russian Geographical Society. Alongside being a powerful member of the Russian Defense Committee of the government, he is also allegedly close with Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, and the two are supposed allies when it comes to governmental matters. As a result, there is a strong likelihood that Shoigu's ambitions will be funded, or at least carefully considered, before being cast aside. The Siberian permafrost allows for the preservation of DNA, which would make obtaining the Scythian DNA challenging but not impossible should they be able to find a chunk of surviving organic matter. For spiritual reasons, when the excavations of the Scythian warriors are planned, Shoigu has demanded that local shamans attend the excavations to appease the restless spirits of the Scythians and to try and gain their spiritual permission to clone them from the afterlife. It is believed by both Sergei Shoigu and many local people of the Tuva that otherwise the spirits of the warriors will be angered and rain terror on the living. If successful, Shoigu would be able to create an army of the living dead. However, some argue that the wild claims are not meant in true sincerity, but to play their role as a distraction that Russia recently sent out 100,000 of their soldiers to Ukraine's borders. When asked about how the excavations are going, Shoigu responded with, We have conducted several expeditions there already. It is a big international expedition. Shoigu has also made various references to the infamous case of Dolly the Sheep as proof that cloning is within the realm of possibility. There is no way of knowing how sincere the Russian ambitions are or if they are actually planning on resurrecting this classical army from their buried tombs, but there does seem to be reports of legitimate research being conducted related to the science of cloning and archaeological diggings. Lost Renaissance Masterpiece Discovered Hanging Above Woman's Hot Plate Sells for 26.8 million US dollars Sometimes things that are lost are hiding in the most unlikely of places, and occasionally they are even hiding in plain sight. This was the case with the recently discovered Renaissance artwork that had been considered lost to history. Philomene Wolf, a Parisian auctioneer, was tasked with evaluating the contents of a 90-year-old French woman's apartment in Compagne, and was immediately drawn to a small, old-looking piece of artwork that was hanging over her hot plate in the kitchen. She immediately knew that the painting, which is about 10 inches by 8 inches, was something special and suspected that it was a work of Italian primitivism, but had no idea exactly how valuable it would turn out to be. Wolf took the painting to Eric Turquin, an art historian with a track record of identifying difficult or long-lost works. After a thorough analysis, Turquin and a team of experts were all able to certify without a doubt that the artist of the painting was Seni de Pepo, also known as Cimabue, who is one of the highly celebrated fathers of early Renaissance painting dating back to the 13th century. Cimabue's paintings are incredibly rare, despite being considered a master of medieval painting, and historians only know of 11 of his paintings that currently exist, making this find even more impressive. Art historians were able to identify the painting as Christ-marked, a part of a diptych of eight scenes depicting the Passion and Crucifixion of Christ, likely as part of an altar scene that was separated and sold in the 18th century. Although prior to the discovery of Christ mocked, 
There were only two known panels from the diptych in existence, called the Virgin and Child with Two Angels and the Flagellation of Christ. This new discovery was able to be identified as a member of the set by looking at the wood grain that was consistent throughout all three pieces. Jerome Moncuquil, a part of the team that made the exciting identification, said that they were able to positively determine that the painting was not a clever copy by comparing the wood grain between the sets. They are all made with the same technique on the same wood panel so you can follow the grain of the wood through the different scenes, he reported. We also used infrared light to be sure the painting was done by the same hand. You can even see the corrections he made. Although there are only 11 known works by Simabue in existence, historians speculate that the altarpiece that Christ mocked was originally a part of contained eight panels, meaning that there could be five additional panel pieces left for discovery. The owner of the apartment where the painting was unknowingly hidden away was elderly and moving out of her apartment, and she had no idea that she had an incredibly rare and valuable artwork in her kitchen. She told reporters that she had thought it was a Greek icon painting and that it had been in her family for as long as she could remember. Despite having been hung over a hot plate used to cook food for all those years, experts reported that the painting is still in excellent condition, apart from minor accumulation of dust. Considering the fact that the painting was made around the year 1280, it is truly impressive that it was able to remain in such good condition for all this time and reminds us that you never know what might be lying in wait in some nondescript place for the right person to come along and uncover it. The Temple of Angkor Wat was bounded by a mysterious structure 1.5 kilometers long. In December of 2015, it was discovered that the world's largest religious monument is actually even bigger than we once thought among other brilliant insights provided by this research team. The Temple of Angkor Wat, located in Cambodia, Southeast Asia, has been thought of as the world's largest religious monument for hundreds of years, having been built in the 12th century, once at the heart of the Khmer Empire. Bringing a modern twist to this knowledge, however, is the work of a team of Australian archaeologists who have found we can actually expand the recorded size of the temple thanks to their use of ground-penetrating radar whilst investigating the Angkor Wat complex. The research mission, dubbed the Greater Angkor Project, was led by Australian researchers, Professor Roland Fletcher and Dr Damien Evans, who work with the University of Sydney. Their investigation revealed more components to the temple than we had previously known of, as well as the complex being bounded on the south side by a large structure adding to the previously recorded size of this record-holding temple. When speaking on behalf of the team, Professor Fletcher said this structure, which has dimensions of more than 1,500 meters by 600 meters, is the most striking discovery associated with Angkor Wat to date. Despite this being a fascinating finding, there is still plenty we are yet to uncover. To date, the purpose and function of the structure remains unknown and we are yet to find a parallel or otherwise similar structure in any other Angkorian works. Aside from the large adjoined structure, the team also discovered buried towers that had been assembled and removed throughout the period, estimated to encompass the dates surrounding the construction and first uses of the temple at the Angkor Wat site. Even more new information has come to light as a result of this investigation, challenging the misconceptions surrounding the temple. For decades, centuries even, we had held the assumption that on the land neighbouring Angkor Wat stood similarly sacred precincts and cities of religious importance. However, this team has found there to be evidence of a sparse population's housing among these areas. The research team believe this could suggest residential use of the land, theories supported by the findings of roads, ponds and mounds. Current speculation says that these were all used by people working within the temple, in positions of service, largely such as priests. Another fascinating revelation made courtesy of this project is the discovery of wooden structures having been created to secure and strengthen Angkor Wat. Archaeologists predict that these wooden structures have been implemented towards the more modern end of the temple's history, leading Dr. Fletcher to describe it as a possible last attempt at defence, an opinion expressed through his statement. 
Angkor Wat is the first and only known example of an Angkorian temple being systematically modified for use in a defensive capacity. The placement of these defences on a more modern timeline, estimated between 1297 and 1585 AD, suggests that the addition of the defences could have been in an effort to resist the growing influence of the city Ayat Thaya, a city nearby. Dr. Fletcher summarised with the concluding thoughts, Either Data makes the defences of Angkor Wat one of the last major constructions at Angkor and is perhaps indicative of its end. This relatively recent insight into a temple so long out of use points to both the complexity of human civilization and the momentous discoveries that continue to lie ahead of us and the abundance of new leads and information to have come from one research team is a true testament to their important work. Denisovan's DNA reveals mystery of human evolution. We have long had an interest in those that came before us, and while the Neanderthals are spoken of somewhat with frequency, the Denisovans were only found to have existed in 2008. This recent discovery of their ancient existence has led to many shifting details in our understanding of human evolution. They have made an appearance in our archaeological field and have left a trail of new research in their wake. Even following their finding in 2008, our timeline stood to be corrected, with us believing they existed just 50,000 years ago. As of 2015, however, we found that this number was far too limiting, and that, despite initial understandings, the Denisovans had been hanging around and walking the Earth for what could easily have been tens of thousands of years longer. This age correction was the result of speculations surrounding the true age of some fossils that were key in understanding this species. DNA from the species was tested, obtained from a tooth fossil found in a southwestern Siberian cave. From this tooth fossil, alongside the other somewhat limited data we have so far on this species, researchers have been able to conclude that the Denisovans were more accurately walking the Earth a staggering 110,000 years ago. The director and co-author of the study, Svante Pabo from the Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, said in an interview with CS Monitor, We got the first glimpse of genetic variation in Denisovans, and it turns out they have quite a bit of variation, about as much as Neanderthals. The tooth fossils looked at were determined to be from two separate people, with one of them having been alive a significant length of time before the other. This was determined by the missing mutations within the genes, giving us further insight into where these specific genes may have come from. Despite some people's theories, the Neanderthals and Denisovans, whilst similar, are very distinct species. Their resemblance is incredible, with the differences between their species only being evident after very closely analysing the original fossils. This intense level of examination that is required is what allowed the Denisovans to go undetected for so long. But what do you make of these recent discoveries? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.